The following program is brought to you with limited commercials by American Express. You are about to see a China you haven't seen before through the eyes of an American broadcaster who knows China and her people as few others do. She is Yu Sai Khan, whose weekly TV series is seen by a staggering 400 million Chinese, making her a significant link between China and the outside world, and a household name in the country of her birth. In this uniquely personal journey, we'll visit Yu Sai's hometown of Weilin, where fishermen still use cormorants to land their catch. Explore Shanghai's headlong rush into consumerism. Tune in with a billion Chinese for a close look at what they're watching on TV. Visit a health spa where the water and mud have legendary healing powers. Walk the Great Wall. Visit the tomb of China's first emperor. Get a rare glimpse of Mao Zedong's private residence. And bundle up for some cold and colorful winter festivities. Now Yu Sai Khan will show you a new China few people really know. There are two very popular words in China these days, kai fang. Translated, they mean opening the door to the outside world. They signify a major change in direction for the Chinese, a strong desire to know more about others, and a warm welcome to foreigners to come in to get to know them better. I'm Yu Sai Khan. In the next hour, we'll look behind kai fang, that open door, on a very personal journey through a China I have been privileged to know. Some of what you see may surprise you, because this China is in the midst of a profound social and economic change. I will show you a country that is both ancient and new, 20th century ideas living side by side with 5,000 years of history and tradition. And I will introduce you to some of my friends who are experiencing firsthand a major transition in their lives. It is important for us to know about the Chinese, because what happens to one quarter of the human race eventually affects all of us. They have never been closer to us than right now. So join me on my journey through a changing China. This is Guilin. They call it the most beautiful place between heaven and earth. Guilin is my hometown. We Chinese have a very special feeling for the place where we were born and where our ancestors are buried, a sense of belonging and continuity. My parents met and married here, and I love coming back as often as I can. It is a landscape Chinese painters and writers have made famous throughout the world. 1,500 years ago, a poet wrote, the river forms a green silk belt. The mountains are like jade hairpins. Guilin's River Li meanders through the dreamlike landscape of Guangxi province in southwestern China. It winds its way around improbable limestone towers and tropical bamboo forests. Carved by wind and water for over 300 million years, these legendary mountains once rested at the bottom of the sea. The town of Guilin gets its name from the Gui trees. In fact, Guilin means forest of Gui trees. Every October, the air is filled with the delicate fragrance of Gui flowers. It is an intoxicating scent I'll always associate with my childhood. Here in Guilin, fishermen for centuries have used cormorants to catch their prey. The special bond between the bird and his master has been developed over many years. Strings are placed around the cormorant's neck to keep the bird from swallowing its catch. And at twilight, the fishermen on their bamboo rafts encircle a small section of the river and begin an ancient choreography of sound and movement. The light from the lanterns attracts the fish, and the cormorants, with noisy encouragement from their masters, do the rest. Mm. 
The Guilin I left as a child was a small, sleepy town. The Guilin I returned to is busy and thriving, with over 4 million visitors last year. Now that official permission to travel is no longer necessary for the Chinese, they have become the biggest group of tourists in their own land, and Guilin has always been their favorite spot. The Chinese people have more money and the freedom to spend it is apparent in a small town like Guilin, and even more so in the big cities. It's early morning in Shanghai, and China's largest city and busiest port is coming alive. Located on the Huangpu River, Shanghai is truly the big apple of China. Along the river bank, people gather for their Tai Chi exercises, it's a ritual that begins before daybreak. Many adjourn to nearby food stores for breakfast before heading off to work. Shanghai, with its population of 12 million, has always been a cosmopolitan city, the commercial hub of China. All around us are reminders of the past, of the city's early role as an international trading port and a leader in China's industrial development. Shanghai hasn't had an easy past. It survived the Japanese occupation, social and economic upheaval, and more recently, the devastating effects of the Cultural Revolution. But the Shanghainese are a people with a very special spirit. And now in the 80s, they have once again become the trendsetters. Shanghai today is buzzing with a new feeling of sophistication and energy. And the open door policy initiated by former leader Deng Xiaoping is largely responsible for these changes. A flood of consumerism has recharged modern China. In the walk fast, talk fast environment of a free marketplace, Shanghai has become a paradise for China's new breed of entrepreneurs. And with money to spend, the Shanghainese are buying. What you are seeing is the daily opening rush of number one department store, the largest store in China. It may look like a sale, but it isn't. Prices are fixed by the state. There are no sales, exchanges, or refunds. Almost half a million shoppers pass through these aisles each day, and many come from other parts of China. Weddings are a major time for spending. It's fashionable for brides to have as part of their dowry what are known as the three wheels, a sewing machine and a bicycle, the three noises, a transistor radio, TV and a washing machine, and the 36 legs, a dining table with six chairs, a couch and a bed. It used to be that clothes were worn for nine years. Three years is new, three years is old, and three years is patched up. But today, the Chinese government is encouraging consumerism, and fashion is the thing. Shanghai has been called the Paris of China. If they are wearing it here today, they will want copies of it in Nanjing and Beijing tomorrow. It has also been called the Hollywood of China. The Shanghai Film Studio, China's oldest, has produced many of the country's major motion pictures. This city is a place where deals are struck and profits are made. Over the years, it's acquired the image of a wild and wicked town, filled with street smart businessmen. I asked the mayor, Jiang Ziming, about the city's rather dubious reputation. Foreign businessmen always say Shanghainese are shrewd. They are hard to do business with. 
But I say, if you want a partner to do business with, who would you prefer? Somebody who's smart or somebody who's foolish? Of course, you will go with the smart one. In the 19th century, Shanghai was divided into foreign concessions controlled by the British, French and Americans. The foreigners made the Shanghainese second-class citizens in their own land. But there is a part of the city never touched by foreigners known as Old Town. The area was once surrounded by a moat and an imposing wall built to keep invaders out. Most of the wall is gone now, but the past still lives on here. A popular attraction in Old Town is Hu Xingting, which literally means pavilion in the middle of the lake. It houses shops, snack bars, restaurants, and tea houses. Dim sum is another popular food item here. It's as much fun to watch it be made as it is to eat. There are those who fear cultural pollution from the West. They say, don't open the doors and windows because flies and insects will come into China. But Deng Xiaoping says, open the doors and windows, breathe in the fresh air, and we'll take care of the flies and insects. There may be some unwanted capitalist flies in Shanghai, and some spiritual pollution from the West. But Shanghai wasn't exactly a model city to begin with. With its huge population, it's a crowded, low-rise, walk-up urban planner's nightmare. The congested streets make Manhattan look calm. And yet, the Shanghainese love it here. In Shanghai, there's a saying that goes, I would prefer to have just a bed in the heart of the city than to have a whole suite of rooms in the country. In a downtown Beijing restaurant, customers are watching gun smoke in Chinese. There are over 100 million TV sets in China, and over 400 million people are watching at any one time. China uses TV as a tool to inform and educate, and the government has made low-cost black and white TV sets available to everyone. And one of the things they see these days is commercials helping to fuel the new economy. From fast food duck to this one for Tianfu Cola. But this family isn't watching commercials. They are watching my program, One World. One World is the first Chinese television series ever produced and hosted by a foreigner. It's aired twice a week in English and Mandarin. Hello, I'm Yusai Khan. China Daily credits One World for giving China a global perspective indispensable to its modernization. I even introduced them to Kermit the Frog. Ni hao, everybody! <laughs> Kermit, you speak Chinese! Well, just a little tiny, tiny there are bit. other Western programs on Chinese TV, movies, sports, and Donald Duck. Here he is with the Monkey King, a popular figure in Chinese mythology. He's saying, Uncle Donald, I would like to invite you to my house for Peking Duck. China's new open-door policy means more contact with foreigners. Everywhere we went, we heard Chinese speaking English. Quite a change from the 50s and 60s, when it was chic in China to speak Russian. Today, English is taught as the most important second language. What color is your shirt? My shirt is white. Okay. What color? The secondary school we visited in Guilin teaches English to all students from the seventh grade on. Very, very good. You have learned the teacher is from New Zealand, one of hundreds of foreign experts invited to come to work in China. Like to read for us. Give Sandy that shirt. Give Sandy that coat. Give Sandy those children. Give Sandy those socks. One thing you must remember. Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. First time I came back to China as an adult was 15 years ago. Coming from America, nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. 
Anti-American posters were everywhere. Revolutionary songs blasted on every street corner. There was tension on the faces of people. Even my own uncle refused to see me for fear he might get into trouble with the Chinese government. But in today's China, the people are quite different. They are warm, open, curious about the outside world. And they have opinions. No, sorry, I don't agree. I don't agree. On Sunday mornings in parks all over China, hundreds of people gather to practice their conversational English and to talk with foreigners. Today there is a great thirst for knowledge and for success. I want to continue my study as the business administration. Uh, and I can do what I want to do. Uh, I am study international finance. And when I graduate, I want to be a lawyer. <laughs> so perhaps... Most of the Chinese uh, college students, when they graduate, they want to find a good job. The earlier you could get rich, the more glorious. If I pass it, I can go abroad, go America. The most important thing uh, for our young people to go abroad is not to study their cultures, I think. Most important thing is to study their technology. The American people are always diverse, you see? <laughs> diverse, maybe 50 percent. <laughs> but in China, it's quite different, I think. But there's no problem with divorce. What's wrong with divorce? If you could not get along with a wife, why just, why just uh, no, lie no. on bed with, your, with the wife who has no, you have no interest, you have no desire? In China, most uh, young people and students uh, don't believe traditional Marxism. Mm -hmm. They believe, I think, new ideas from Western. Mm -hmm. I don't think the old ideas is, is bad. I just want to take the good things from both. I read a book, it is said in America, government is like rubbish, rubbish. I read, I read in a book. <laughs> Some people tell me, don't talk about government in the US. Government cares nobody. Is that true? I read in a book. Whether the young people want to hold on to traditional Chinese values or not, it's clear that Western influences are part of this changing China. And I still believe in the bright future. You know, I still have a dream anyway. <laughs>
The fact that farmers today can afford such a sumptuous meal says a lot about the economic upswing in China. The air may be cold, but the bargaining is hot and heavy at this farm produce market. Started by the government in 1978, local people rent space and sell their produce for personal profit. Products like this spicy roasted chicken are particularly hot items. Competition is fierce and those who offer the best product win. Store after store selling the same thing and yet this couple seemed to be doing the most business. The woman in charge told me that their chickens sell for four yuan or just over a dollar per pound. On a good day, her profit is about twelve dollars, which is very good money. Then there was this shepherd I encountered near a section of the Great Wall. He had been on the road for four days, driving his sheep on foot from his home in Inner Mongolia to sell in Beijing. He reckoned this herd of over 200 sheep would bring a nice profit, since each sheep could sell for as much as $18. I saw examples of this kind of individual enterprise all over China. This village called Qibao is located about 100 miles west of Shanghai in southern China. Three generations often live together under one roof. Peasants in China live in cluster housing. The land is owned by the state and it leases individual plots of land for families to cultivate. As rent, the farmers deliver a set quantity of grain or other crops to the state at a fixed price. Beyond this, Farmers can now use their land to grow and sell anything they want at the free market. The atmosphere at the market is bustling and lively. And why not? These people know that the money they're making will actually go into their own pockets and end up buying them valued items like televisions and refrigerators. In China, unlike other developing countries, there is much less of a population shift to the cities because farmers are now able to work in industries in their own communities. It is interesting that this crocheting being done at home is actually commissioned by a Japanese company. Yet with all these economic changes, something stay the same. Cabbage, for instance. Although there's an increasing variety of vegetables available, northern Chinese still consume an outrageous amount of cabbage. In the late fall, a family begins to hoard away as much as 400 pounds, a throwback to the old days when cabbage was the only vegetable available in the long winter months. It may be a China in transition, but the old ways die hard. We are in Xi'an at the old city wall. Xi'an was the first capital of China, founded by the first emperor Qin in the third century BC. This brilliant man standardized the laws, the currency, and the written language. He also built a fine road system and completed the Great Wall of China. But Qin was a cruel emperor. He executed scholars, burnt books, and forced hundreds of thousands of peasants into slavery. Qin boasted that his dynasty would last 10,000 years, but it vanished just three years after he died. Vanished, that is, until 1974, when peasants digging a well made an amazing discovery. It was a vast grave complex containing thousands of terracotta warriors. Horses, chariots, and bronze weapons. A complete life-size army arranged in battle formation. They were all facing east, 
guarding the tomb of the Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi. Foot soldiers, cavalry, officers, even the personal guards of the Emperor, all in armor, all individualized like fine portraits, all of them frozen for eternity in battle readiness, as if two centuries was nothing more than a blink of an eye. Another enduring legacy of Emperor Qin is the Great Wall of China, the most beloved landmark of the Chinese people. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it runs from the desert to the sea for over 4,000 miles. To gain some idea of its scope, imagine a wall 20 feet high and 20 feet thick, stretching from New York to Los Angeles and then back to Chicago. The wall's beginnings date back to a time when China was divided into several feudal states. Actually, the wall wasn't a wall then, but individual fortresses built to protect the feudal states from one another. After he conquered his enemies and united China, Emperor Qin mobilized a massive workforce of several hundred thousand into the task of linking these fortresses to form a great wall. Through the ages, the wall has stood not only as a physical barrier, but as a psychological one as well. It reinforced the ethnocentric view the Chinese had of the world. The wall was designed as a cultural barrier that kept barbarians out and true civilizations in. It is ironic that the wall that once stood as a divider, separating one country from the rest of the world, now brings together people from all over the globe. This is Beijing. With its wide boulevards and congested traffic, it is China's capital. At its heart stands the Forbidden City. Also known as the Imperial Palace, it is a testament to China's imperial past. The entire 250 acres of the palace contains a labyrinth of over 9,000 rooms. Here, China's last emperors lived in medieval luxury, isolated from their subjects and the encroaching Western world. Another imperial enclave, also off limits to the citizens of old China, is the Temple of Heaven. Each spring, the emperor, the son of heaven, ascended these steps. In front of this altar of heaven, he performed three kneelings and nine prostrations to pray for bountiful harvests. Crafted entirely of wood and built without nails, the temple soars 125 feet into the air. It stands as a masterpiece of 15th century architecture. And then there is the Summer Palace, where the imperial family refined the art of decadence. The Empress Dowager and her retinue enjoyed leisurely walks, sumptuous feasts, and stage performances that went on for days. There were extravagant indulgences such as this marble boat of purity and ease, financed with funds originally intended for the Imperial Navy. The opulence, the luxury, all of it eventually led to the fall of dynastic rule in 1911. The Forbidden City, the Temple of Heaven, and the Summer Palace, once forbidden to all by the imperial court, are now open to the public. Tiananmen Square is the symbol of new China. It was here in October 1949 that Chairman Mao hoisted the flag and declared the founding of the People's Republic of China. All of China's leaders make their public appearances here. Not far from this site of countless historic events is where today's Chinese leaders live and work, an exclusive walled complex called Zhongnanhai. Against this backdrop where emperors used to luxuriate stands the house where Mao Zedong lived for 17 years as the leader of China. We were honored to be the first Western TV crew permitted to film here. It is exactly as it was in Mao's time.
The furnishings reflect the Spartan lifestyle of a man who lived the proletarian philosophy he preached. Mao was born a peasant, was self-educated, and pursued knowledge all his life. He slept on a plain wooden bed, surrounded by his books. This is the desk that Chairman Mao used. I understand that he used to work until very, very late at night. He loved to work at night. And as you can tell, this is the calendar. On this day, he left this house. In an adjoining room, we found a ping pong table. Besides swimming, this was his favorite sport. Mao also ate very simply. During the late 50s and early 60s, when many Chinese were starving, he refused to eat meat. A more startling contrast to the decadence of the past would be hard to find. But China has changed a great deal since Mao's death. Several hundred feet away from where crowds still flock to see Mao's final resting place, you can buy a bucket of the colonel's decidedly un-Chinese chicken. And that isn't all. A new China is emerging. Housing, factories, hotels, restaurants and stores are springing up everywhere. So are visitors from all over the world. Just five years ago, it was impossible to even reserve a room here. Now you can have five-star luxury and charge it. China has finally opened the door to the Western world. It is a unique opportunity to see the past rubbing shoulders with the present. Many people have heard of the healing paths of water from the Ganges or Lourdes, but very few people have heard of the miracle water from Wu Dai Lian Chi in the northeastern part of China. They come as early as five in the morning from provinces throughout China. The object of their pilgrimage? This muddy looking water. It may not look like it, but the waters of Wu Da Lian Chi are said to have legendary healing powers. Trace elements that have seeped into the underground stream in this volcanic area have made the water here rich in minerals. Drinking it regularly is said to aid the digestive system. The water here is cold, in fact barely above freezing. And scientifically, it's hard to prove exactly why this water appears to affect such miraculous cures. But the people who come here don't care. This particular pond is known to help in the treatment of skin diseases. This 67-year-old woman, who has been here two months treating a problem area on her leg, proudly shows me how her condition has improved. I asked this coal miner, who also had a skin ailment, why he was holding a watch. He says he can only stand the water for about 20 minutes, and every minute counts. Others here have found a cure that's a little less chilly. They sunbathe as they soak. For those who prefer a private bath, there are these tubs. Or if the full body experience is too much, you can treat just the trouble spots. I asked this man what he was doing, and he answered, I am washing the nerves in my brain. And it isn't only the water that is therapeutic here. The mud of Wu Dai Lian Chi is supposed to work wonders on a variety of ailments like hepatitis and anemia. No, this isn't the latest trend in designer crash helmets. People who come here for the mud treatment are hoping to stimulate hair growth. The cure involves covering your entire head with a neatly packed mud pie. A damp cloth is then wrapped tightly around it to retain the moisture. Mud pie headwear isn't confined to men. I found women and even young children taking the cure. This woman told me that she was bored when she arrived, but now her hair is coming back. Far from the mud and mineral water of Wu Dai Lian Chi is a place well known throughout China as a center for traditional Chinese medicine, Shanghai's Longhua Hospital. 
Here I saw examples of how China is maintaining its centuries-old traditions right alongside the latest Western medical advances. Take, for example, acupuncture. Practiced in China for over 2,000 years, it is a method of inserting needles into specific points of the body to treat disease and relieve pain. Surgery is a recent Western import. Traditionally, it was against Confucius' belief to violate the body. At Longhua Hospital, I witnessed the removal of a neck tumor using acupuncture as anesthesia, a practice used in about 10% of all major operations in China. The patient receives no drugs. Instead, she is given six needles for six acupuncture points, which are electrically stimulated. She is conscious and able to communicate with the doctors throughout the operation. 45 minutes later, the operation is complete and the tumor is removed. I talked with her as she came out. The doctors told me they perform about 800 operations like this every year. They said this patient can go home in a week and return to work in two. Another traditional healing method little known in the West is Qigong. Why? Because at first glance it seems totally incomprehensible. But Qigong is supposed to be remarkably effective in treating disease and improving health. Although it has been practiced in China for thousands of years, it has never been more popular than it is today. It is even taught in schools. This class of 11-year-olds is doing Qigong exercises to correct problems with their eyesight. I talked with Dr. Feng Li Da, the director of the Institute of Immunology in Beijing. Her research with Qigong has produced verifiable results. Qi is a form of human energy, a form of bioelectricity. It's like other forms of energy, including magnetism and microwaves. Qi is a form of energy not only in how it relates to the human body as a whole, but also in terms of how it interacts with nature. The Qi master has developed his or her energy to a degree where it can affect others. This is called outer Qi. However, it is the inner Qi of the patient that must be harnessed for the therapy to be most successful. Qigong is also used in the treatment of serious illnesses. Imagine fighting cancer without drugs, radiation or surgery. Most people who come here are cancer patients from all parts of China. Quite a few were diagnosed as hopeless. This 33-year-old man suffered from an inoperable brain tumor. His treatment consisted of group and individual breathing exercises to develop his internal energy. After a few months therapy, his doctors reported there was a vast improvement in his condition. While Qigong may not work for everyone, I did find many success stories here. On the other hand, there are many skeptics who dismiss it as little more than faith healing. But for believers, Qigong is doing what it has done for thousands of years, quietly working wonders. Many Chinese still think of Heilongjiang province as the vast desolate northern wilderness, not a place on the usual tourist map. But in many ways, my trips here offered me the most surprising and revealing look at the Chinese. Heilongjiang is one of the three provinces that make up old Manchuria. Strategically important, because it borders the Soviet Union, is blessed with abundant natural resources. Nowadays, it's considered one of China's wealthiest provinces. But it is the hard work of Heilongjiang's 33 million people that has really made the difference here. A people not easily intimidated by harsh realities. On the Songhua River, the air temperature is about 20 degrees below zero. And the water temperature? The man with the thermometer says three degrees. Fahrenheit or centigrade. That spells cold. 
According to the experts, a healthy swimmer has at most several minutes in this water before harmful effects settle in. Not an activity for the faint of heart. This frostbitten madness isn't confined to the young and restless. This well-preserved fellow is 64. He told us that he swims for about a minute each time. And this gentleman is 58. He stays in the water for two to three minutes. Actually, winter swimming is supposed to help develop your immune system. It's also supposed to help your circulation and make your skin tone more youthful if you survive. This is probably one of the few places on earth where dancers put on thermal underwear and mittens to strut their stuff. It's early morning at Harbin train station and a hundred or so hardy souls are beating the sting of winter with a uniquely frosty brand of disco. Miserable weather, you say? Stay indoors? No way. Dancing isn't confined to the icy extremes of winter either. In summer, I found large groups of people moving to the beat of locally recorded pop music. Everyone from tiny tots and factory workers to grandmothers and lawyers seem to be enjoying themselves. Disco has found a home in China. There are more than 50 ethnic minorities in China. Here in Heilongjiang, China's northernmost province, the Koreans make up the largest ethnic group. I'm in a village of 4,200 inhabitants, of whom 92% are Koreans. To the north of Harbin, Xinhe is a small farm town of 920 families. Like all of China, this community is in the midst of growth and change, but progress hasn't affected time-honored traditions. Today is the annual Old People's Festival. The day is filled with numerous events that center around a lavish alfresco lunch with Korean specialties. During mealtime, it is the young who serve the old. Even high-ranking members of the local Communist Party come to pay their respects. And what do the old do? Enjoy themselves. From dawn till dusk, the village elders, ranging in age from 52 to a spry 90, participate in fun-filled activities. It's their day, and they have been looking forward to it for weeks. There's a new twist to the 50-yard dash. Each participant has to light up the cigarette and smoke it as he runs to the finish line. There are other variations too. Some of the races are based on practical village skills such as this rope-making competition. But the audience's favorite was a Korean version of Pin the Tail on the Donkey, where the object is to knock a pail over with a stick while blindfolded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a river which has two names. The Chinese call it Heilongjiang, the Russians call it the Amur, because this river separates two superpowers, China and the Soviet Union. And never before has this area been captured by Western television cameras. While there, I visited Heihe, the largest town along the river. Even at this northern edge of the country, we see progress and change. It is obvious from the activities here that a new era of trade and cooperation with the Soviets is beginning. The Russian influence is seen on a larger scale in Harbin, a city of about four million people. It was a virtual Russian colony under Tsarist rule, and its architecture is a constant reminder of that past. There is much in this city to admire, but it is in winter that Harbin truly comes alive. Every January, all 19 acres of the Zhaolong Park are transformed into a wonderland of the most amazing shapes and forms carved out of ice. 13,000 cubic meters of ice are pulled out of the frozen Songhua River and used as the building blocks for these frozen fantasies. 
Artists and builders, some professional, some amateur, use chisels, hammers, and shovels to make stunning castles and figurines. The larger structures, like this pagoda, took a team of 15 workers about two weeks to build. Everything was done by hand. Only water and the bitter cold of a typical harp in winter hold the blocks of ice together. The highlight of the festival is the grand opening ceremony. Accompanied by much fanfare and fireworks, the entire area is lit up like a sprawling Christmas tree made entirely of ice. The festival gets its name from the lanterns fishermen used to make by putting a candle in a block of ice. These modern lanterns use Christmas lights instead of candles. Only some are the size of buildings, and they come in every shape imaginable. The Harbin Festival runs on for weeks until the melting ice announces the arrival of spring. Until then, however, Harbin is a place full of light, color, and magic. A place where people don't hide from the severity of the winter's cold, but instead embrace the gifts of nature with fortitude and industry, with joy and a spirit of celebration. The idea of change is not new to the Chinese. It's a road they have traveled for almost 5,000 years, and its turns were often very sharp. Once one of the most accomplished and influential of early societies, they have also known isolation and subjugation. They have been conquered and colonized, and now they're in the midst of a massive experiment that combines socialism with some of the elements of capitalism. A leader here once said, China's road may sometimes swerve to the left or to the right, but it always moves in one direction, forward. Well, whether we agree with that assessment or not, it is evident that the people of this country are embracing these latest changes with characteristic enthusiasm and vigor. They are, after all, a people not only of huge numbers, but of enormous capabilities. And today, their boundless curiosity and energy are finding expression in Kaifang, their newly opened door to the rest of the world. I hope this hour has helped you to know them better. I am Yu Sai Khan. The preceding program has been a special presentation from American Express.